Okay, turn to Z, what's the next thing? Hit a Mount Tender, okay. And it said, Mott Pass. That's what it said on the readout, Mott Pass. And I said, wait a minute, what the hell's a Mott Pass? And I said, okay, we'll try hitting, hitting another, hit another key! That fixes everything, right? Hit a bunch of other keys. And it came up and it said, Erreur frappé. Well, guess what? I speak French. Mot pas, mot pas, password. They didn't tell me about that. So I got the guy on the phone. I said, uh, what is the mot pas for this thing? He said, what's that? I said, it's the password. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, okay, let me explain it to you. Your cash register is speaking French at me. He was not speaking French when I bought it. What the hell did you do to it? He said, I didn't do anything. I say, we have a problem. What is going on? You were the last one to touch it. I'm holding you responsible. I did not give an authorization to change the citizenship of this particular machine. It is now Quebecois. It's trying to set up its own distinct society here in the storage locker. I'm not going to allow that. What is the password? He said, try one. It'll affect it. He said, okay, try two. I said, oh, no, I see where this is going. Why not? I tried it. That didn't work. The freaking password was two. Okay, great, great, I'm happy, I'm happy, okay. Mon pass, merci beaucoup, Mr. Redestel, okay. Person is such great. spat out about eight feet of tape. The language was not English. It was not French. It somewhat resembled cuneiform. Or maybe Russian because some of the E's were backwards. And I got the guy back on the phone and I said, it's being extremely disagreeable with me. And he said, yes, that's just like the French. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I said, what is my alternative? He told me the alternative. We'll just take it. Fortunately, when you all catch registers have a journal tape in, it's that second tape that keeps a copy of everything. And I took that home. And it didn't take very long to go through all 5,000 yards of that tape. Okay, one t-shirt and two t-shirts. <laughs> when people come to me and they say, I would like to run a furry convention, I say, no you don't. Trust me, no you don't. If anybody sometime would like to know exactly what it's like to run a convention, especially one the size of Icon or Anthrocon or Worldcon, come and talk to me, just make it in the bar. Buy me a drink, I'll tell you everything you need to know. But since I don't have a drink right now, I'm not going to tell you any of it because I'm feeling ordinary. <clears throat> Speaking of French, it's a beautiful language. Um, I had the pleasure of knowing, pardon, for the past 10 years, a lady by the name of Josie DiCarlo. And if you don't know the name, you might know the name of Dan DiCarlo. Uh, Dan DiCarlo was the man who created the look of Archie Comics that the iconical drawing style was Dan Carlo's drawing style. He created that in the 50s. He created the character of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Josie and the Pussycats, named and modeled after his lovely wife. Uh, Dan passed away in 2001. And uh, I had known them a little bit before that. And, uh, well, it's interesting, we tend to look at famous people and we tend to form these images in our minds of them. And we, we, we create the perception. Dan was the guest of honor at Amphicon in the year 2001. And I was a little bit nervous because here is the, the grand old man of Archie Comics. He's a legend of the comics industry. His wife, Josie, a French lady by birth, they had met in World War II. 
Very, very petite, very proper. How are they gonna how are they gonna react to all of this? You know, fursuits bopping around and, and do strange things. And what if they wind up in, in that corner of the art show? You know that one over there? So we were sitting down to dinner and I, I was, you know, I'm Mr. Big Businessman. Yes, I am the CEO of this organization. This is my beautiful hotel. I know this how professional I am. I wear a talk. No idea. And Dan sat quietly and listened to this. Sitting to my right was our programming director, a beautiful blonde girl by the name of Susan Rankin. When I finally stopped to take a drink of water, Dan looked at Sue and said, What kind of a drunk do you make? <laughs> you ever hear the expression spit tape? They, they really happen. Uh, <clears throat> Sue was rather startled and she said, you just have to get me drunk to find out. And Dan waved to the waiter and said, bring us a bottle of wine. Make it two. And that's when Josie leaned over and said, yes, that is Dan. He always loves a pretty girl. It, even even today when, when we, we go out to the, the party, or see, he always gives me the, the little pinch on the derriere. Okay. I guess he, he will take to this. I asked Dan uh, how he and Josie had met. He told me a harrowing tale. He had been a paratrooper in the latter days of World War II, just before the Battle of the Bulge. Josie at the time was living in Belgium. She actually started the story. Uh, that beautiful voice of hers and that accent I love so much. She described what it was like in an occupied country. She never named them. They were always Zem. When Zem, she would say, Under Zem, you never have any fun. You cannot go dancing. You cannot go to the movies. Because you go to the movies, Zem would come and they say, You, 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 come. And then the people you never see again. Well, then, the GIs, when the GIs come, there's a dancing and the, the champagne, and, and, and everyone is so happy. And I said, this is great, so, so you met at the end of the war, and Dan said, yeah. We had a jump, went bad, there was, you know, air was full of flak and everything, and the jump master shouted, you boys got to get out now. And we said, we're not anywhere near our drop zone, and he said, we're going to go down, you guys get out. He quickly booted us out the door, red light was on and everything. I couldn't even see anything, totally dark. I just, you know, closed my eyes, grabbed that ripcord, pulled it. That chute wasn't open more than three seconds before I crashed through the roof of the house right into the bedroom of this absolutely stunning, completely unclad redhead that I fell in love with and have had her by my side ever since. And I said, oh my God, that is the most fantastic day. When Dan died, I went to see Josie and she finally told me that Dan's story had been very, very slightly embellished. In his lifetime, she had never corrected him. She had never told anybody. But Dan actually was not a paratrooper. He was in the motor pool. And he and his buddy, after the town had been liberated, they're out there and they had a little map and guidebook trying to find something. And Josie's cousin saw them. And of course, back then, since she I do always try to help them out. So my cousin, she, she, um, she, she goes to them and she says, let me help you, please. So she shows them what they try to find. And then it was the custom, of course, that you, you, you take the shi back home and you give him his dinner and, and, and entertain. And Dan's buddy, he say, yes, very much, thank you. Uh, do you have maybe a, a girl to, to be a date for, for my friend here? So, you know, we, we have to ask my father. My father, very, very strict. My father said, you do not sleep with the Germans. You will not ever sleep with the Americans. But we talk to him. We say, oh, Papa, please, please, I, I want to. And so he said, all right. All right, maybe it's OK. So they come. They come to the house. And it's a nice uniform. I spent all day. I put on the rouge. And, and I put the hair up to the bow. Yeah. And Apparently, as she describes it, and I'm sure as history would have recorded, she came down the stairs, and Dan, seated on the couch, jumped up and said, I want the little one. 
They say that in every story, the truth lies somewhere in between. I think it's a little closer over here. Because I later on found a book. And the book said, Dan DeCarlo, in big letters on it. I said, I must buy that. I know his wife, she's a dear lady, she's a good friend of mine. I bought the book and I opened it. And then I looked at the cover in little letters, the pinup art of Dan DeCarlo. He was um, what my grandmother, when she was still alive, would have described as a sick fuck. <laughs> There's some stuff in there kind of would make your toes curl today. <clears throat> and, and later on, uh, a few years ago, when I went to visit Josie, and that visit was a little bit sad. She had moved down to Florida like a lot of old people like to do. That age had caught up to her. Uh, we, 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 we do not discuss the age of a lady. A lady is of a certain age. So I, I will not and never will tell you how old she was. I can tell you because she has stated herself that she was 16 years old when the Nazis invaded Belgium. Look it up on Wikipedia and do the math. So about, I guess it was 2007, 2008, I had heard that she was not very happy down in Florida. Uh, she really hadn't made any friends down there. She was alone much of the time. Uh, she, she had to have a caregiver come in during the day because she was having trouble getting around. And that broke my heart. So I called her up. Still remember when she picked up the phone. Hello. I said, hey baby, how about a date? And she was a little surprised. I said, what are you doing the evening of May 19th? Or something. I said, Pull out your best dress, we're going out for a night on the town. So I flew down to Florida, went out to her place, and we went out on a hot date. Well, hot as it gets when you're on the second page. She insisted that, that I, I stay the night in the guest room of her house, and we stayed up very, very late. She told me more stories about Dan. Uh, for example, when they first met, she didn't really speak any English, and he didn't speak any French. He courted her during his entire stay in Europe through his art. He would draw pictures. For example, she showed me one. I would love to know where this is now. A picture of a little, little cartoon Dan in his Class A U.S. Army uniform with a, a big box of candy and, and a bunch of flowers under this arm standing on a particular street corner with a clock tower in the back said 8 o'clock. He would give this to her so she would know, let's get together and have a date tonight at 8 o'clock. I said, that's really sweet. And then she turned the page and there was a drawing, which was of Army Dan, leaning on a table with his trousers down around his ankle, and beautiful Josie, a nurse, with a syringe filled with little hearts standing behind him. And I said, well, that, um, that sort of says it all, doesn't it? And she said, oh yes, that was Dan. And then, of course, there are the pictures we keep in the family. I had no concerns about them showing up in that corner of the art show after that. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very sad to say that, that uh, Josie passed away just a couple of weeks ago. I drove up to uh, the town of Scarsdale and went to the viewing for her. And something that had been bothering me since that hot date of ours. She had spent the entire evening speaking to me in French. She, we, we never spoke English. And it had been eating at me because I didn't know. Had she reached a point of decline where she could no longer speak English, you can only speak her native tongue. I was, I was heartbroken by that. I told the story to her, her granddaughter at the evening, and her granddaughter said, oh yeah, that was grandma. Anytime they go out to a party, anytime they go anywhere, she would missile lock on the French person in the room and just glom on them all night long. And I said, okay, I feel a little bit better. So uh, She was a darling. I went up to uh, the coffin. She looked very, very beautiful. She was always a beautiful lady. And all I said to her was, Merci d'être mon 
Those who speak French will understand that. <coughs> it, it is interesting, again, when you're the chairman of the convention, you meet a lot of interesting people. You, you become friends with the guests. Some of the guests will, will stay friends for a long time. But even before I was chairman, I had the, the tremendous honor of meeting uh, Mercedes Lackey and Larry Dixon. Uh, it was early on in my, my tenure as a bird, if you will. Uh, I got to talking with Larry, and I was living in Arkansas at the time, and they lived in Oklahoma, and Larry said, you, you want to come out sometime? You know, come out and spend the day with us. And I was like, cool, fan, boy. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. It's out of us. They only lived five hours away. For some reason, when you live in Arkansas, it's only five hours away. It's an afternoon drive. You know, something about the distances down there. <clears throat> I drove out on the appointed day. It was to show up at noon. I showed up at noon. They had an unusual home. It sort of looks like a giant habit trail. It was originally a massive concrete igloo that a gentleman had built thinking he would make his fortune building tornado-proof houses. And the thing was but ugly, so nobody bought it, and he died in poverty. Misty and Larry bought it. They actually constructed a wooden shell around it, so it looked more like a windmill that had lost its veins. And then they built all these outbuildings with these ramps and tunnels and stuff going through. It was a habit trail, actually, now that I think about it. And I went up to the door. He said, go up to the red door. I did not want to play the play. All you old people know that one. And I knocked on the door. And I knocked again. And the place was deserted. I thought, okay, is this a trap? What's going on? And I knocked again. And the door opened. And a very, very sleepy-eyed Mercedes Lackey in her nightgown blinked at me. And I thought, this is going to be very awkward. I said, now, hi, I'm, I'm Sam Conway. And she said, oh, oh, yes, 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 come in, come in. Larry didn't tell me you were coming. Well, thank you, Larry. He was still in bed. These folks are, uh, are an odd lot. They are not terminal. They, they literally will, will go to bed around 5 a.m., get up again at 4 in the afternoon, and do their work at night. Uh, I did at one point get them out in the sun just to see if they melted. They did not. So we were all right there. One thing that we have in common, both of us are, are quite, uh, both well-versed and well-enamored of wildlife. They have a wildlife rehabber's license. I've done wildlife rehabilitation in my past. Maybe that's a connection to the furry family in there. But uh, they particularly are fond of hawks. And not just birds of prey, but birds in general. Their house is filled with birds. I mean, literally, there's birds everywhere. Mostly the citizens, parrots. Now I can understand why they stay awake at night and sleep during the day. Because when your house is full of parrots, they, uh, they like to hear themselves talk, shall we say. And every single parrot had its own personality. There was the one who had his cage next to the telephone. That was his favorite sound in the world. And he was good at it, because they never could tell if they were really getting a phone call or whether it was the, the bird. Then they had the parrot, who simply liked to scream. That was his thing. You know, he would have been very, very happy at an anime convention. Then they had the parrot who had fallen in love with James Earl Jones. Waking up at their house was an experience that I will never forget. You know, you don't need an alarm clock when all of a sudden on cue you hear, Ah! Hurry! This is CNN. <laughs> all day long, all day long. But going to visit them was always a lot of fun because I got to help out with the wildlife. And those skills are something you take with you. You always keep an eye out for things. And I tend to have wildlife encounters that I you know, everybody runs into a wild animal every once in a while. And maybe it's a furry thing. When I run into wild animals, odd things happen. Back in my graduate school days, I lived in a little room in the back of a home, owned by a nice old lady. And she had a cat, a monstrous cat. He must have been part mountain lion, so big was he. 
His name was Irish, and he decided that, that I belonged to him as soon as I arrived. He adopted me. And that was kind of nice. It's nice to have somebody to come home to, especially when you're a graduate student. And sometimes you have to work late. Very often, Irish would just, he would know. Cats had this instinct. He would be sitting outside waiting for me. And you know, when you pet a cat, your blood pressure goes down. Endorphins get released. That's how they control you. <laughs> they know it too. And there was one particular night, foggy, after midnight, something like 1 a.m. This is at Dartmouth, the wilderness of New Hampshire. And that fog can be very, very thick. And it was hot and muggy, August, I think. I came home, I had a bad day in the lab. Things just were not working right, which often happens, which always happens. And I was tired, I just wanted to go to bed. But there was Irish waiting for me. And I sat down sadly on the doorstep, and I gave me love to have him right, right at the back of his neck. I started talking to him. That's, that's what anthropomorphics is. Anthropomorphization. You, you, you tend to treat animals like human beings. So I was talking to him, telling him about how hard a day I had in the lab, and, and how dreadful the life of a graduate student is. And as I was telling him this, Irish came walking around the corner of the house. And I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> skunks like to be petted behind the skunk, right here. Because there was a skunk sitting there looking up at me like, dude, what the hell? I kind of like it, but, you know. And I said, hmm, okay, I'm just going to go this way, right? And the funny thing is, that skunk kept hanging around for about a week. Kind of like, you know, maybe you wanted more or something. Or maybe Iris set him up to the now cats. And just a few months ago, in my home right now in Malvern, Pennsylvania, I had a little condominium. It's a lovely thing with a nice stone wall outside. I opened the door one evening, opened the door and stepped through it, and right here on the stone wall, just a foot or so away from, uh, from my eyes, was a bat hanging upside down, kind of stuck to the wall. Sitting so still, I wasn't quite sure at first if it was real. And he was here, I was here, and I said, like, wow. And I, I got right close to him. Open his eyes and raise his head a little bit. And I was like, dude, you're a bat. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. So I said, well, that's that's just cool, you know, that you're a bat and all. He said, uh huh, whatever. There's something I can do for you? I said, no, no, I'm just, I'm just, you know, just gonna go back inside, okay? He said, yeah, whatever. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I went back inside. I thought he wasn't a very nice bat. I didn't think much more about him. I went to bed, and, uh, and my button fell off, and uh, went to sleep. No, had a drink, then went to sleep. Sorry, I got that right. Um, in bed. And the next morning, got up, got ready for work. I go to work very, very early. And uh, I opened the door, and I looked over, and he was still there. I thought, well, that's decidedly odd. Bats normally do this kind of flitting around thing. So, very, very curious, I kind of reached up and and he tapped him a little bit. And he said, boy, I'll oh, you again. And I said, yeah. I'm like, you know, this is really, this is really bizarre because normally, you know, if I were to do this to another bat, he'd like fly away. You know? Maybe your part stump. You like it when I do this? And he raised his head again and he said, dude, you, you do know I'm a rabies carrying species, right? And I said, yes, I just remembered that. Funny you should mention it at the exact same time. I'm just going to go back inside again, okay? Yeah. So I'm thinking, know what to do. I got a bat actor. Yeah. And froth at the mouth, and he made bite me, I'll turn into a zombie. So I called the police. And I called the police and I said, hello, I'd like to report a bat. The lady said, is he jumping from the rooftops chasing criminals? I said, no. <laughs> but he is acting in a very bizarre fashion and I'm concerned. 
And she said, what's he doing? I said, nothing. And she said, what's so bizarre about that? I said, well, that's because in my experience, bats usually do something other than nothing. And, well, I would very much like to have an officer out here in, in, in case it bites me and I turn into a zombie and shoot me in the head. <laughs> so she said, we'll call animal control. I said, brilliant, brilliant, send them out here. They said, and she said, they, they got on duty at 8 o'clock. Well, well, that's no good. I, I could be a zombie by then. So I said, look, you know, it's, it's not like Melbourne is a hotbed of criminal activity. Can you just ask an officer to breeze on by? So she said, well, all right, I'll see who's available. So I kind of paced around outside. That didn't move. And I, I'm kind of worried because, you know, uh, the, the rabies test, shall we say, is not very pleasant for an animal, if you know how they do it. <laughs> so I felt bad for it. So I kept telling them, dude, you, you better do something. You know, flap your wings. You know, do something other than froth, okay? Just... But he was like, no, no, whatever, I'm cool. I said, no, you're not cool. So after a while with no officer, I thought, well, I'm going to have to apprehend this felon myself. So I went inside. This is the, the good thing about being a chairman of a major convention. One of my hotels is Doubletree. Every year at Christmas, they send me a tin of Doubletree cookies. You ever stayed at Doubletree Hotel? So I get like six of them and devour them completely with a bottle of wine. And I have all these tins. So I took one of the tins and, and uh, you know, scraped out the cookie crumbs out of it. Made nice and clean. And I went out to the back and I said, okay, dude, I'm, I'm going to put this tin on you and I want you to do something. If you do something, I'll drop the tin, scream like a girl, and run away. But you've got to do something, okay? I don't want you just to sit there. If we got a deal, and he said, come at me, bro. And I'm like, okay. So I put the tin on him. I took the tin off. I put the tin on him. I said, okay. I'll just stand. No, this isn't going to work. So I got the lid of the tin. And I came back in and I said, okay. Dude, I'm going to do this one more time. I put the tin on and he And he starts doing that echolocating thing. And he was saying, dude, there's no cookies in here. I said, I know, that was my whole point that I was trying to tell you, all right? So I kind of put the lid on it and I thought, all right, here's what I'll do. I'll take it into work. And when 8 o'clock comes, I'll call animal control myself and have them come get it. And I started to go to the car and I thought, okay, wait, there's a, there's a basic flaw in this plan. So I'm going to go to work, and the first thing I'm going to do is go to the gym. I'm going to put this cookie tin on my desk. I'm going to go to the gym. And poor old Matt Malloy, he's going to come in. He's going to see that. He's going to want some cookies. No, this is not going to work. I've got to find plan B. Well, just then, a police cruiser pulled up. And a policeman got out and said, Hello, sir. I have apprehended the suspect. I have him right here. Um, I advise you, don't leave in the dispatch room. Dispatchers like cookies, too. They never did call me to tell me what the outcome of it was, but I still feel very, very bad, because as an animal lover, as a furry, we, we kind of want to see happy endings for these things. And I suspect for that bad that probably the ending was not very happy, unless the officer did not pay attention to me and left the tin in the dispatch room. It would be interesting to go down to the dispatch room and see if there's a bunch of dispatchers in there. Brains. How many actual furries do we have in the audience? Don't be shy, there's more of us than there are them. You know? Okay, how many people here have no idea what a furry is? You have no idea what a furry is? Oh, I don't know. It's called Anthrocon. I'll sell you a membership cheap. There you go. <laughs> Imagine Icon, but with a lot more fluffy things running around. <clears throat> for all you furries out there, and for the non-furries, I was approached by some people wanting to do a story, a documentary about furry fandom, which often happens. And I agreed to have lunch with them. Primarily because they were paying. And I spent about an hour telling them about furry fandom. 
some of the foibles, the ins and outs, the agony, the pain, the stress, and particularly some of the, the bad press we have gotten, mostly because of our, uh, shall we say, more, more free-spirited youth as a famine. And when the lunch was over, there was a lady who was sitting at a table near us. And I could tell that she was sort of listening to the conversation. And as we got up, she said, excuse me. I thought, okay, here it comes. And I said, yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? And she said, I just wanted to tell you, uh, last June, I was in University of Pittsburgh Hospital for cancer surgery. And I was feeling really bad, but I saw you guys on TV having so much fun. It really made me feel so much better. I just wanted to say thank you for that. That's kind of why we do it. And I turned to the people who were interviewing me and I said, I did not pay her. I do not know this woman. I have never seen her before in all my days. But indeed, when you see these people dressed up in these bizarre animal costumes, going out, talking to the public, having a lot of fun, that is why they do it. It's why any of us do it. We do it for the smiles. We do it for the laughs. Furry fandom is all about very, very momentarily bringing people from the mundane world into a very playful corner of their mind where they can, for just a moment or two, lose themselves and believe that the creature that they are seeing before them is real. That happy, bouncy, smiley thing before them is real. All the fans really can experience it. Maybe not so much with you. I don't know if you really want to do that to people. But, you know, not, not to be uh, specious here. So, one thing about furries is they love to help people. They're always out trying to help people. And that's inherent with us. I've got that instinct myself. I see somebody who looks like they need assistance, I will try to assist them. Now, it's what furries do. I remember seeing a fursuiter at a furry convention. That's a, a furry costumer, by the way, who we were in uh, He was sitting in the lobby, he was looking rather, you know, overheated. And as people have described, wearing a fursuit is like wearing your sofa. It's very easy to get overheated. And I went up to him and I leaned down and I said, are you okay? And he said, yeah, just a little hot. And I said, okay, uh, how, how about I get you some water? And I went to get him a glass of water and he's got a big muzzle and of course he can't drink the water. I couldn't find a straw. So I went back and I got him an ice cube. I said, how about I give you an ice cube? Maybe you can suck on it or something. He said, sure. I said, open your mouth. And he, he opened his mouth and I dropped the ice cube in. And I saw it bounce off his chin and go down here. This was the origin of the fursuit dance competition. <laughs> You've never seen a fursuit move like that. And everybody's coming by saying, dude, that's so cool, we need like some dubstep here. And I say, yeah, that's great. I'm just gonna be over here, all right? That's a true story, too. That, that's exactly how the first suit dance competition came into being. <clears throat> I also had an opportunity, a rare opportunity. Actually, maybe it's not so rare. Maybe it's just that I was able to see it. This opportunity could come by for any one of us. They fly me all over the world to do this here. And again, normally I'm drunk when I do it, so I apologize for my sobriety today. Uh, so I build up a lot of airline miles. U.S. Airways loves me. It's really, really cool when I call up U.S. Airways and, you know, I give them my number and they say, Oh, hi, Sam. <laughs> so I very often get a, a complimentary upgrade to first class. First class, if you've never flown it, it's, it, to a certain extent, it's not worth the fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600 that they, they will charge for it. But if you can get an upgrade to first class, the main difference is you, you hold out your wine glass and you don't even have to say anything. When you bring it back, it'll be full. It, it's like the cornucopia, you know? And there have been times when I have had extended airline flights, you know, and, and I like, like get this repetitive motion injury in my left arm just from doing this. And I recall, vaguely recall, arriving at one airport, which I think was my airport, in such a condition of 
wine indulgence, that I really could not speak clearly. And I couldn't find the, uh, the shelf counter. So I had to pretend to be foreign. I, I, I kind of channeled Dr. Zhukov here. I went up to somebody, oh, excuse me, please. Uh, finding please a uh, car for take to a hotel. Um, yes, boom. Very, very kind people. Maybe it was Kansas City, because the people were very nice. Uh, I had a trip recently out to Seattle. And they had me in the first class seat. And I'm, I'm all right, I'm practicing. I'm sitting here just doing this, getting ready for the flight, kind of limbering up. Because you should always stretch before a workout. So this is my stretch. And uh, one of the downsides to first class is the glowering you get from the other people as they come by. It's like, yeah. like, But as the line backed up, and the line will back up because there's always some guy trying to put a lawn tractor in the overhead back around row nine or something. But no, look, see, it fits. There was a soldier, U.S. soldier, in his fatigues. Um, he had the look of a man who had had a very, very bad day, if you know what I'm talking about. He, he looked like he was not feeling well at all. And... I felt badly for him. You know, my heart does go out to all the, the men and women in uniform. And I said to him, where are you seated, soldier? And he said, 15E. 15E is a middle seat. One of these seats, you know, where you can't even do this because you smack the person next to you. I said, how about I send a drink back your way? And he brightened up, he said, yes, sir. I thought, okay, this is a man I connect with. He's a man after my own heart. We got into the air, and I kept thinking about it. You know, I didn't know what he'd been through, but whatever he'd been through probably was a little bit worse than the day that my shoelace broke and made me think that my life was hell. So when we got to cruising out to the, the sign, came on, you know, no seatbelts, whatever, get out, do whatever the hell you want. I called the flight attendant over, and I said, Miss, there's a... There's a gentleman in uniform back in 15E. I would like to trade seats with him. And she looked at me very oddly and said, you, you want to? And I said, yes, please. Would you, would you go back and ask him to come up here? And everybody was looking at me sort of very, very shocked. Very yes. What is this? Is this man mad? He can't do this back there. And about three minutes later, the soldier came up with his pack, and he was looking very concerned and confused. And I got up. And I said, sit down. And he was, he was kind of smothered. He said, sir, thank you, sir. And I said, no, no, thank you. I said, listen, they put my fat ass in the seat because I fly a lot. That's what I did to deserve this seat. I suspect that whatever you did this morning, you probably deserve it more than I do. So why don't you have a seat here? So he took my hand, he sat down, and I went back and sat in 15E like this. And the lady next to me was very, very skinny, and she leaned her seat back. And I discovered I could do this. And the flight attendant, unbidden, kept coming back from first class with that bottle of the high-class wine. And the entire way to the airport, I got my workout. Everybody wins. I like it when the story ends like I guess that's the end of the story, because when we got to Seattle, I remember that I was on the, the right, he was on the left, we were kind of leaning on each other as we walked like this. And I got picked up by a friend. He might still be at the airport, now that I think about it. No, I'm, I'm sure he made it home. But, uh, I really felt good about that. And, and people say, oh, Uncle Kage is such a wonderful person. No, I'm not a wonderful person, I'm an American. We all want to do that, keep that in mind. Uh, and people also say, Uncle Kage is a celebrity. I'm not a celebrity, I'm an old drunk who talks too much. <laughs> you know, it's true. But apparently people, a lot of people know, who is Uncle Kage? I still don't understand it. But I have crossed a particular 
milestone in my career as, as an entertainer, as a rap conteur. I've won up on To The Rand in Britain, too. I'm really excited about this. I had my first psycho stalker. It's like, woohoo! Hey, the big time! Down in Florida, um, this past July, I, people like to talk, man, like to talk people. I struck up conversation with this young man, and he was, he was being very, you know, animated, and we were talking about things, and talking about the state of higher education in America. He was very erudite, and well-spoken, and, and intellectual, and I, I like this guy. I, I can sit and talk to this guy all day. And we had a lovely conversation. And I had a panel coming up later that afternoon, and, and I realized I, I left something in my room, I don't remember what it was. I said, you know, I need to go up to my room to get something. Why don't you come with me? We will continue our conversation. Oh, I remember it was a bottle of wine. It was in my room and in the fridge. I had to get that. So uh, you sense a, a recurring theme here? This, by, by the way, a hint for Mr. Cornell. Next time. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so we went up to my room. And, you know, he sat down on the sofa and, and I sat down. You know, why not? It's quiet up here. And as we were talking, at one point in the conversation, he rather abruptly said, what do you know about the Baker Act? I said, hey, I, I don't think I know that the, the, the thing about the gun control. He said, no, no, look, look it up. Florida's Baker Act. Oh, okay, so I turned around my, my laptop computing device, and, and I, uh, I looked it up. The Florida's Baker Act. Very controversial law, which, uh, you know, you can see why it's controversial. In essence, distilled down to the controversial point, the Baker Act allows a police officer to arrest and detain a person on the simple suspicion that that person may be mentally disturbed. And I read that and said, well, that puts every single furry convention at risk. And he said, yeah, I've been victimized by that so many times, I'm constantly having police officers grabbing me off the street and throwing me into cages and shooting me full of thoracity and hitting me with, with electric prods. And I said, how dreadful. Look at the time. We have to go now. <laughs> so I stood up and said, let us go downstairs to where all the other people are. And he said, that's great. He had a suitcase with him. Hi. Hi. What's up? Uh, unfortunately, I was sent to collect and redistribute the audiobook. Great. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> So, he had a suitcase he was dragging along with him. He said, I'll just leave this here. I said, ha, that's not a good idea. Let's go downstairs where all the other people are, as I said, where the large crowds are with witnesses. Let's go. So I convinced him to take the suitcase along, and we went downstairs, and that little voice in the back of my head was saying, it's time to bid this gentleman goodbye. Now, I have never been able to tell a person, especially a fan, to piss off. It's just not in my makeup. I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You know, I am here to make people happy, to make people feel good. I don't want to do the opposite. So I have all sorts of little tips and tricks that I pull. And in this particular case, I went up to the ballroom where something was being set up, and I said, now I have to go into the ballroom, which only I can go into at this point, and get something. So it's been great talking to you. <coughs> and he said, it's all right, I'm security at this convention. And I said, oh, this is dandy. So I went into the ballroom, and he was behind me, continuing to rattle on about the Baker Act, <coughs> and how it victimized innocent people like himself. And he was starting to get a little scary, and scarier by the moment. <coughs> I really should have got that glass of soda that I wanted. Anyway, he, uh, he was like clinging right behind me as I was trying to pretend to find something. And just then, a gentleman named Yappy Fox, the chairman of that convention, <coughs> happened to come into the room and he said, Oh, uh, Uncle Kage, could I ask you a question? I said, Yes! You may ask me the highly important and confidential question over here. And we went over here. And the guy follows us and says, uh, give us just a moment, this is, this is convention stuff, you know, that, that we have to talk about, shh, really, hush, hush, wait over there. 
and I ran into a little breakout room with Yappy, and, uh, and he asked this question, and I don't remember. I said, no, you can't get herpes from that. Anyway, this guy <laughs> is really starting to freak me out. I, I've never had anything like this before. Just then the guy walked in. I said, uh, not yet. We're still talking the confidential secret, etc. Outside. So he stepped outside. I looked at his door, right to the back of the house. I said, can you get me out of here? <clears throat> so Yaffe took me back through the service corridors and round the outside of the hotel, through the floor, into the front, and I was telling him, okay, this guy said he was security, and Yaffe said he's not on our staff. I said, aha, this needs to be reported. Oh, it's a baby. Anyway, uh, we went to the security station to make the report. And the security guy was writing in the book. And I said, as soon as you're done there, I have something to report. He said, okay. And I happened to glance down and he was writing and I saw this guy's name. I said, oh, you, you already heard my story. He said, no, I didn't hear your story. I said, what are you writing there? Apparently he caught this guy back in the house looking for someone. <clears throat> so I said, let me add to your tale. And the security guy said, okay, I put it in very detail there, and he said, okay, if you see this guy again, just point him out to me. So I said, thank you, and I started walking. Hotel corridor made a 90 degree left turn, and as I went around, there was a body lying on the floor against the wall. And I glanced down, and it was this fellow. He had his eyes rolled back, and he was lying up there with his eyes rolled back, muttering Bible verses. I said, okay. And I turned surreptitiously to the security guy. <laughs> so the security guy went by, and I said, I'm going to go this way. And I went outside, and I was kind of talking to somebody out there, saying, okay, I'm, I'm really rattled by this. I, I, I've never handled this sort of thing before. And just then, I heard a scream from inside. My first inclination was to go inside and see what's on. I opened the door, and the security guy came by and said, uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> so I stayed outside. The curiosity got the better of me. And I poked my head in. This guy was screaming at the top of his lungs, shouting random Bible verses and inserting my name into them. <laughs> Which, on one hand, is flattering. <laughs> on the other hand, is ungodly creepy. So I kind of hid around the corner, and people came, and they were giving me a play-by-play. -play. They're like, okay, hotel security's here now. And they're like, <laughs> okay, now the police are here. I thought, okay, good. <laughs> And then a big cheer went up from all the onlookers. Yeah, yeah. I said, they just hooked him up, didn't they? Yeah. And the guy looked around and said, they, they've got him in handcuffs and leg irons and they're carrying him out. I said, great. Baker Act. Live it, love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think these gentlemen are trying to give me a subtle hint that my time is up. And since I'm feeling agonizingly dry and still painfully sober, I'm going to bid goodbye to all of you. Oh, hang on. May you are a dear, you're in the garden. It's a terribly much I'm looking forward to this one. Not wine and water. That's water! Farm Jesus. Oh, all right. Farm Jesus is the water. Thank you all. I, I seem to be having another panel um, somewhere. Where am I going? What's the team? What's the team? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, man.